Paul in this season? Where's my Elijah in this season? I need, I need a template. And God's like, not for you. You have me. I'm going to show you what this looks like. For you, I'm good enough. And that's what the Israelites had when, when they came knocking on his door like, hey, Samuel, tell God we need a king. And God was kind of offended, like, really? I'm your king. No, 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 we got it. We, we got what you did with the fire and the sea and the man and all. We got that. But we need a king king. We need what other people have because it'll, it'll validate us and we can touch that person. We can say this is our symbol. Other people can't see you guys, so we need a king king. And he's like, you don't get it. I'm not only enough for you, I'm the greatest for you. So as I repeat, if God's speaking to you right now, stay there. If he's guiding you, stay there. If he's, uh, if he's upgrading what he's saying, stay there. Just continue to rock with him. Amen? Um, and I'm going to... Eh, let's go in with prayer. Let's go in with prayer. Lord, there's not enough words in our, our, our languages, any language on this earth that can capsulize who you are, that can accurately depict your greatness, your glory, your value, your supremacy, Lord God, everything that you are, we're getting tinges of it along the way as we live our life. And so, Lord, just let our eyes be open to the new aspect of who you are. Let us be open to a new characteristic, to a new, new understanding, to a new way of operating that you're calling for us, Lord God. Let these times that we come together as a body, Lord God, the church is not a building, it's your people. And so, Lord God, as we commune, even if it's this space, if it's uh, online, if it's in passing, Lord God, let us exchange our God points. Let us enhance what we know about you so we can be stronger. Let us be chiseled out in your fashion, Lord. So we thank you for everything you're doing today. Every word that you're speaking, every healing that's taking place, every confirming that you're doing, every validation that you released in this atmosphere, Lord God, we say thank you and we appreciate you. So, Lord, as we move forward, let us be able to put in play everything that you're showing us about your character. You don't reveal who you are just for us to be surprised and amazed. You're looking for it to be incorporated, replicated, an extension of your kingdom, Lord God. You give out talents. You give out spiritual gifts. You give out understanding, Lord God. You're looking for an output. It would be in our best interest to try and gain as many people for your kingdom as you've assigned to our lives. So, Lord, let us take in every piece of accountability. Let us receive every responsible thing you're calling us into, knowing that you sourced us everything that we need. So, Lord, today we honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. I, I can tell there's some excited people in God today. I seen I seen people worshiping. I seen flags. I seen um I seen uh cajon. You was on the cajon, man. I, I learned that the cajon. You out there, ba -ba -da -ba -da. we need that. That worship, those things, those components are needed because we do not know when God said, "I'm gonna step in," but I'm gonna step in a little bit greater if that little toddler over there does one little twirl. They don't even know what that twirl means, but that twirl is going to do it for me. And I'm going to snap on the atmosphere. So we thank you for everybody who participated in worship and in prayer. And throughout the week, if you're uh, stewarding your relationship with God throughout the week, when we come together, it's not like, oh, let me, let me drum up this God now. No, it's like, I've been on fire all week. You on fire? I'm on fire? We come together, our blaze is like kaboom. And... I, I told you a couple weeks ago when we, were, when we were in this atmosphere and God was like moving, it was like a piece like saying, hey, it can't just stand these four lifeline walls. And before I know it, somebody was like, got it, opening the door and like just taking the worship from here outside is hitting the atmosphere. I know somebody at the dispensary pulled up was like, man, I don't even need that weed today. And they just pulled right off. I feel it. I feel it. I trust it. Somebody got a touch outside of what they normally do. And that's what we're called to do. We bring God in. We bring him into the atmosphere. So if you haven't practiced it, if this is a new concept for anybody out there, especially virtually, if it's a new concept, like, wait a minute, I could be touching God all week and then Sunday it could be increased. Yeah. Yeah. Step it up. Step, step, step into the greater. I'm not trying to say you don't need the corporate. There's something that's accomplished, but your private time, you have more than your corporate time. So in that Get as much of God as you can. Yeah. 
it's not the responsibility of the leadership or the musicians or the singers. All of us has a way of touching God. We can impress him with our worship. For some people, it's actually uttering the word, Jesus, Jesus, you're wonderful. Like, it might not seem like much, but for you, just saying his name might have been a blockade. It took me, I, I explained this to the men at the mountain, it took me years to say hallelujah. My hallelujah would only come out interrupted. I get like the first part of the word together because I was, it, it made me, I'm, I, I'm, my young mind in Christ, I felt like it made me less manly if I was yelling out. So I'd be like, I'd be in service like, yeah, holla, holla, ha ha, All right, nobody, if I go all the way, it's going to look bad. And then when I got before God, he was like, extend. And when it was just me and him, it came out, it was like, it was a triumphant yell. And I can't turn back. I know what it's like to be able to exalt him and exhort him in the fashion that's due to the glorious name of Christ. So if you're there, stay there. Uh, if you're able to listen right now, y'all know where we are. We're in accountability season. Oh, we. Oh, we. It's been weeks. I see. Look, look at that. I, I'm hoping I, I see young people like, yeah, I've been doing more chores at home. Yeah. They ain't had to tell me to do it. Yeah. I've been turning off my anime. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't pointing no fingers. But no, nah, it's it's stepping out of. What, what, what we think is okay, and when God says, I've assigned this for your life, and he said, this is what I'm calling to come out of you, you have to embrace that. We're going to look at somebody today who had excuses, and it didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't matter. Their excuses, even though they were valid, it didn't matter when God said, That's, you still messed up. So for us, accountability is critical. All right, so we're going to step into more. We're going to step into more. So today... We're looking at wasted efforts. Ooh, I know. We're going to look at this from two sides, too. Like, uh, uh, accountability is not always bad news. Accountability is sometimes, if you're looking at it from the right light, it's the same way as, like, you're, if you value correction, correction hurts, uh, refining hurts, but if you recognize what's accomplished on the other end, God, you've been pruning me. You've been snipping stuff, some stuff away. But... I've already experienced enough in you knowing that that pruning is going to lead me to a better area. So accountability may not be like, yay, I want more responsibility. It might not be on the top of your list, but it's also like a badge of God saying, this is where I've brought you because as I increase your accountability, I'm increasing who you are. I'm sourcing you out more. So we read the story about the talents, like the one got one, two, and five. We're like, well, the one that got five must have been like superior level. But the ones who got one and two, if you steward them well, it steps you up higher. And it's like God can trust you with more. So wasted efforts. Now, in God, there is permissive will. There's perfect will. There's things that he's calling for. And if we're looking at it based upon what our definition says, we can be off on what God's assigning. I learned this years ago, actually when I stepped into the bay, you have to define every instance how God defines it. If you define it based upon your limited frame of understanding, even though it has all the characteristics that match up to what your definition is, if God doesn't call it that, you're wrong. Think about when the disciples came to Jesus like, hey, when your kingdom going to be returned? And Jesus like, he didn't come out and tell them like, I'm not here for the Jews. I'm not here for Hebrews. I'm here for everybody now. But they couldn't receive that. They were thinking that the Messiah was coming to redeem their culture. The Messiah came to redeem mankind. So if you're defining a Messiah based on one group of people, when God's like, I'm doing this for everybody, go back to Abraham. He said, because of you, all nations will be blessed. They weren't hearing that. They only thought about the thousands of years where God's saying, you're my people, you're special, you're great, you're particular. That's their template. So when he says, I'm the Messiah, they're only seeing it from the lens of, oh, he's coming to bring Israel back. And God's like, open up. I'm doing this for everybody. And so when we have an undershoot of God's definition, we'll also attach an expectation that probably won't be met based upon our, I put that, me and, me and my wife was talking this week, me and Chris was talking, and in it, I had that understanding that if you have an expectation based on what you interpret God saying, you can mislabel what the outcome is. You can call it something else like, well, that didn't work. 
Because God said this. God's like, I did say that, but it applies this way. And so when you're able to open your mind like, like, oh, that's what you're talking about. It opens your world up to what he's saying. So we're going to start looking in um, 1 Samuel 13. And this is our wonderful friend Saul. Our wonderful friend Saul. King Saul. As much as like he was the first king, he started out, he, out the gate, he was the man. He was prophesying. He won battles. He rallied the people. But then self got in the way. Self got in the way and also desire got in the way. Also motivation got in the way. So if we're looking at our efforts and what we're accountable to, as we engage them, if you don't know off rip why you're doing it, your walk will start to show you where your heart is. God will take your obedience if it has a, a motivating factor outside of him, he'll take that and he'll use that to mold you into doing it unto him. But if you stay there trying to gain, your heart will be exposed. So let's look at Saul, King Saul. And as he's the first king of Israel, you get to see where his understanding was. And even though he was in that position where he was accountable to and didn't honor it. So in 1 Samuel 13, he, and this is referring to King Saul, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. Backdrop, they're getting ready for battle. They're getting ready to battle the Philistines. Samuel told him beforehand, hey, chill, stay there, I'll be there to come. I'm going to come sacrifice. I'll sacrifice, you'll go into the battle, you'll get the victory. So that's what Saul was told by Samuel the prophet. Now, here he is. So Saul said, I'm sorry, and the people were scattering from him. So he's seeing his soldiers get a little skittish. They're waiting for Samuel. He's not coming. The battle's about to begin. They start getting nervous. So because all this is not in place, you have someone like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm out of here, king. I ain't fighting because, you know, we should have been about this business. We should have did this fast. So Saul says, he said, bring the burnt offering to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. This is a big no-no. The only people who were supposed to sacrifice in the Old Testament were the priest. He was royalty. He was king. That wasn't his role. He saw a need. He saw something that needed to be done. God said he wanted it done. He just took it into his own hands. And as, and as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Crazy thing is, if he would have waited just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. If he'd have been patient, if he would have been obedient, Samuel would have been there. But it was at that moment when he took control on his own, he took the, the word, the action, the effort, he took that on his own and he subverted, he took out what God ordained by the priest to do. So he stepped in doing something that was supposed to be done, but it wasn't for him. I'll be dead honest. I've done this. I've told you all this before. I'm like a little kid when it comes to God's uh, uh, instructions. If I get wind, and this is where I'm growing, y'all can hold me accountable. If I get wind sometimes of what God says needs to be done, some people, there's people who have come and told me like, hey, God said, blah, blah, blah. We need to do this. I need to do this. I get excited like, yeah, let's go, God. And I start running with an assignment that's not mine. I've done that repeatedly, so you can hold me accountable. My wife's looking at me like, yes, I will. There's, there's times even now where I'm like, oh, the church needs something. I'll start Googling, and like, she knows when I'm doing stuff that's out of my lane. Like, we'll be talking about church functions or whatever God's saying, and I'm like, oh, for real? And like, I slowly slide my phone up. I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, oh. He said, what? And I'm Googling whatever to get in place, and she's like, what you doing? I'm like, nothing. Are you scrolling? <laughs> No, we you turn your phone around. I spin it around. It's like a YouTube video, how to link or set up. And she's like, that's not your assignment. Put it away. And I'm like, man, but God said we need to do it. Let's do like I get excited. Right. But I've learned I can take somebody's assignment and I'm out of place. If you step into something that wasn't assigned for you and God, even though it's the right thing in God, you're accountable for it because you're wrong. And so when I was doing that, and 
Uh, shouts out to my brother Pat in Fresno. He knows this. We used to work together in ministry. We, he'd come telling me, hey, man, God said this. I'm like, let's go. And I start running. He's over there like, yeah. And I'm, I'm already halfway into this thing. And God's like, after I've already invested time, effort, God's like, why are you here? Oh, God, you said. I said it to him. Now. Is that you? And I'm like, oh. And so I'm wrong. Even though you did the right thing, but if you're not the assigned person, you are wrong in God. So let's cut out all that good intentions. Don't work in God. Amen. You either obey his instructions or you don't. I have to get on my son. I'm not going to say which one because I don't want to put Dane on blast. But like uh, sometimes somebody likes to do everybody's chore because he knows it needs to be done. We'll say from upstairs, hey, we need the dishes done. And the person who did them last time, don't touch them. And then we hear click, 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 click. click. And we come down there. He's like, what? Like, no, what are you doing? I, I'm just doing the dishes. I know that's nice, but I'm going to punch you. It's not for you to do. You're taking somebody else's opportunity. And so even though he has a good intention, he's out of place, and I got to correct him. And so now I do give him a gut punch. Like, what you doing? Wow. Like, one of those just to shut him down. I appreciate his willingness, but that has to be in balance. He's accountable to it. So for Saul to offer up this sacrifice, out of place. You dead wrong, my dude. Saul comes up and he has the audacity to roll up on Samuel like, hey, yo, what's up? And Samuel probably riding in like, is that, is that bull? I smell, is that burnt bull? Like, he, he, he already knows something up because Saul is rolling up on us, right? So Samuel says, what have you done, my dude? King, what have you done? And Saul said, hey, listen, when I saw that the people, like they were scattering from me, like they was getting ready to run, they want to fight. Um, and, and, and that you, you ain't come, you remember you said a couple of days, you ain't come in those days. Listen, you were supposed to be here on Tuesday. Man, it's Friday. They, they started scattering, you weren't here. And then I looked up, hey, the Phil look, the Philistines is getting ready, they, they're getting ready to battle a, a mic-mash. They're getting ready to get their battle forces together. So he had, honestly, three legitimate reasons. Like, hey, the people scattering. If we don't do this now, we ain't going to have soldiers. Hey, you, you said you were going to be here by this daytime. You're not here. And then, of course, look at the enemy. He's getting ready. We got soldiers leaving. The battle's starting. And you were supposed to be the firing pistol. You ain't here. Of course, I, I had to do it. He said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. I had to sacrifice because the favor of the Lord wasn't here. So I, and this is where he kind of throw on the extra salt. You know when people are out of place, when they add extra to their argument, the stance to convince you, hey, I forced myself. You know how hard that was for me to cut up that bull and put the fire to it? I had to force myself. I don't even like dead animals. I was gagging. I almost threw up the whole, like, he's putting in the extra to convince Samuel that this is the right thing. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering myself. Like, you weren't here. The men are scattering. The enemies together. What was I supposed to do? I knew what God wanted to do, so I did it myself. I had to force myself, so I did it. So he stepped out of his responsibility. We talked about on Wednesday night, wonderful conversation. If you didn't watch Wednesday's message or Wednesday's kingdom class, go back to it. It's talking about, we talked about agreement. Agreement means that there's, there's, there's two things that, two sides that come together, and there's an understanding. So King Saul understood he's the king so his agreement to be king he knows i'm not the priest i'm not the prophet i can't sacrifice so in order for him to honor that agreement of being king he knows he's not supposed to step into that role he's not supposed to take on what somebody else's assignment is so even though he's in agreement to do something his do and as uh fahima brought up was like passive like i'm not supposed to do something my agreement of my role as king is not to f try to fulfill the role of priest. Now, fast forward to New Testament, we are a royal priesthood. So we're royalty and we get to sacrifice and worship. So God kind of combined those two. So feel, if you need to feel good about yourself, that's what God allowed for us in the New Testament. Um, and we're living out now. So he's wrong. He gave his excuses, even though they sound valid. I mean, I've never been, well, I've been in a fist fight before. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's something that you want to keep your eye on an enemy, right? You know, hey, that person talking reckless. They trying to punch me. Like, you keeping your eye on them, you get kind of nervous. They start getting close to you like, hey, 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 like, hey. 
it's going to look different. I can only imagine if you got people that's trying to kill you. Hey, uh, hey, uh, uh, where Samuel at? They, they come, they come in. Our people leave like he got nervous. He responded to his natural things, but it wasn't of God. And so Samuel tells him, he says to Saul, you have done foolishly. King, that was a foolish move. You knew your role. I told you what I was going to do. That's my assignment. You step out of who you are to do something. You're accountable for that. Even though you did what needed to be done, it means nothing. It was wrong. So even though it was an action that I told you was going to take place, you did it out of place, so it was wasted. How many of us have stepped into an assignment that God didn't say or something that we said, oh, this got to be God because it's the right thing to do. And at the end of it, God's like, that's not what I told you to do. It makes sense to you. In your eye, it means good. I, I mean, me and people have been con having conversations over the last couple of weeks. I'm hearing this uh, recurring sound of, well, I'm a good person because I do good things. Who defines those good things? Is it culture? Is it your family? Is it you or is it God? Because if you define it on what makes sense to you, well, that was good. I did a good thing. If God's like, that's not what I assign good unto you, it's a waste. There's people who are living a life of I've done good. I've given to the poor. I've given this. I've done that. And God's like, I called you to be a missionary. And so your good efforts were done in convenience to you. And it was a waste because you spent 20, 30 years building up your wealth to disperse it in a place that I didn't call for it to be released. It needed to be in another place, another, another part of the globe. But because you didn't source me, you didn't get your assignment. And sadly, I've made it available. I spoke to you many times. And so you're accountable for what you didn't have as an output. So even though you did good, it was a waste. So he's calling them foolish. Dude, that was foolish. You sacrificed. He could have came in. Oh, cool, man. Hey, I wasn't here. Good, you, good thing you hopped on that. You took the initiative. No, he said, you're foolish. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God. So he missed the command. You didn't do what God said. It's a wasted effort if you didn't do what God said. And you're accountable to what happens. And with which he commanded you. So for then, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. If you would have just been patient and obedient, if you would have waited like a good hour, my dude, it would have been all real, all good. Your, your kingdom would have gone on forever. But because you did not, you thought what you did was the right thing. In your mind, it was, it was what needed to take place. But you looked at natural factors to justify it. Now your kingdom shall not continue. So here's where the verdict comes down. Should not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, Saul could have walked away like, oh, man, that's kind of messed up. God, I did the right thing. I did what needed to be done. Why are you mad? He still held accountable. He sacrificed. He did it unto God in his own way. And that's a Cain outlook. Well, God, here, take, the, take this. This is my first fruits. And God's like, I'm not receiving that. Well, this is my first fruits. Why don't you take it? Because I'm expecting it a certain kind of way. So you wasted effort. And not only did you waste effort, you got mad at the person who did it correctly. And so for us, we're accountable. Like if you find yourself being upset at somebody who's doing what God says, it's also an indication of where your heart lies. If you're looking at somebody else moving in God, like, look at them fulfilling their assignment in God and being the called person they are. It's a reflection of you. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you're making excuses based upon what God told you and not honoring what he said to you, you're also not turned towards him. Because remember, he gave him three different things why he didn't do it correctly, but it did not take out the responsibility that was for him to do as God commanded. Wasted effort. You could be doing what God wants somebody else to do, but for you, it's a waste of effort. So that means for you, you might be a good singer. But God says, I need you to be in administration. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I could lead them better than the, the prayer worship team that they got now. Praise the word. I could do that better than that person. Let me step into that. Yeah, you might be fulfilling a role. You might get people clapping. You might get the leadership saying, that was awesome. But between you and God, he's like, you're off. You sang so many songs. That was nice. 
but that's not what I assigned for you. You've lost out on what I've actually given over unto you. You have to be careful. I've, I've, like I said, I've done that. I've ran down that, oh, this needs to be done. Actually, I was in a church operating and functioning, and then uh, people were like either leaving or moving on to another church, and different roles in the church were being empty. And I'm like, oh, this, uh, let me go ahead and do this one. So I hopped and did that one, and another one come, I hop and do that one. So I'm doing all these different roles in the church. And I'm like, all right, I'm doing the right thing. And God came in months later, was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, this, they needed help on Wednesday, and they need help on Sunday, and then I could do this on the weekend. And God was like, who told you to do that? And I was like, well, it needed to be done. He was like, I needed that role open. You're fulfilling a position that's assigned to somebody else. So even though it makes sense to you, you're doing the right thing, you're out of position with me. And so for me, it was wasted effort. And so I had to pull back and be like, hey, I can't function in that role anymore because it's not for me to do. We have to be held accountable to it. So Saul was. So that's the downside. You could be doing stuff in God, in church, in ministry. But if it's not your assigned place, it's not going to have the output that God's looking for. So you have to know what your role is. And sadly, King Saul, his kids did not take over the throne. They did not stay on the throne in, 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 in Israel because of this disobedience in God. So now that I gave you a, a, a negative, a, a downside of wasted efforts, I want to show you what maturity in God looks like. And it's not always easy to receive because we're looking for outputs. And sometimes we define things as a wasted effort based upon what took place. And God's like, it's not wasted. This is what I wanted to happen. So. How God defines an action is paramount to our output. How he defines what we do determines how it comes out. So if we're only looking at it from our filtered lens of our own experience, we can offshoot what God is saying. That means good or bad. So as we're moving in him, we have to be intentional of having our hearts placed in his direction. So I want us to look at First Kings. And in it, we got our, our, our wonderful friend, Elijah. He, he comes on the scene like, man, he came like he came in the Bible, like, boom, just come. he came in on doing stuff like I got this. Like, you know, what ain't going to rain for three years. Like he came in. So this is Elijah. He came in. He spoke in early in first Kings uh, that, hey, it's not going to rain for three years. So three years is a drought. They know he spoke it. King Ahab and all the people was like, where's Elijah at? I'm about to kill this dude. We going through a famine. He done messed us up. They blame Elijah. So he's kind of like been ducking around the country and he's like kind of off so they can't find them so he finally appears to uh obadiah says hey i'm here go tell the king i got something to say to him so ahab sent all sent to all the people of israel and gathered the prophets together at mount carmel and elijah came near to all the people and said hey how long will all of you you are god's people you are children of God, you're Israelites, you're Hebrews, we're all family. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Why are you serving two gods? We know our history, we got scripture, we got scrolls, we got monuments. We know who we are. Why are you choosing between God and Baal? You're messing up. And he said, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God to you, then you follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. So this is kind of messed up. As he's telling them, like, hey, y'all know who we are. Why are you picking another God? They all like, we're going to keep it quiet because we've been serving God. But on the week, we've kind of been going to bars and kind of having fun. You know what I'm saying? We've, we've been serving God on Sunday. But, you know, gambling's OK on, you know, when we go to, go to Nevada every now and then. Like, they had two different worlds they were living under. And he's like, no, we live unto one. You either pick God or Baal, the world. For us, that's that decision. Either you choose God or whatever else is out there that you could follow after. And so they were quiet. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, and this, I'll be honest, you got a little braggadocious. Even I only am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So they're on Mount Carmel. It's Elijah, him and God, and you got 450 men and Baal. Like if it was a fist fight, Elijah would have took that L fast. He would only, only a percentage would have knocked him out. But he's like, it's my God against your God. My one God against me and my one God against you and your 450 servers. So he's laying out the contest. He's saying, like, this is us against them. We're going to see who the real God. Right. 
So, uh, let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it also. And you call upon the name of your God, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I, I like the way he kind of put that out there. You call upon the name of your God, I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord. You know which one is real here. But uh, we're going to let the God that answers light fire to this sacrifice, right? And the God who you call upon the name of God and call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all people answer, it is well spoken. So they were quiet when he said hey, either choose God or Baal. You're like, hmm. But he said, whoever answers, we're going to say that's the real God. Got you. Yeah, that's a bet. That's a bet. I only imagine some people like some side. Hey, you got 20. Who got 20 on bet? Who got 20 on bet? Like, they, they had to understand, like, they're torn between the two. So he lays down this gauntlet. Ultimately, if you go through, the, uh, go through some of the verses, the worshipers of Baal, they're out there yelling, they're screaming, tambourines, and I don't know, all the things. God, their God's not answering. They start cutting themselves. They're yelling all day. They're going in, and as nothing's happening, they get more extravagant. They're yelling louder. They're pushing. Nothing's happening. And Elijah, I like him. He, his gangster was on some other level. He's on the side like, ah, where your God at? Uh, he, he in the bathroom? Uh, you might want to go get him. He on vacation, right? I think he's sleeping. You need to go get your dude. Like, he clowning him. So they're doing this all day. And then finally, it's like, all right, y'all had your chance. Elijah walks up. He sets up the stone, sets up the fire, calls upon God. The fire comes down, lights up the sacrifice. And so it's proven. It doesn't take, he didn't do this all day. He didn't have to have multiple people. It was just him and his God, our God. And so then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Forgot to add. He added insult to them. He drenched the sacrifice with water, so it makes it harder for the fire to catch. So God caught all of that up. So God was showing out that day. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord is he is God. So they saw this display and they're like, oh, God is real. Baal is not that one. They professed out of their mouths, Lord, you're God. Everybody said it. They're all in agreement. They saw what took place. They're like, these dudes been yelling, screaming, uh, jumping around, doing spins, cutting themselves. There's blood everywhere. We got coronavirus. We can't have this happening. They're looking at all this take place and nothing happened. But when he has his one moment of calling upon God, the fire comes. They're like, oh, that's got to be real. Y'all doing too much. So everybody's celebrating God. So his assignment was to turn the people back to God, right? That's what God told him. God told him to lay out this, this challenge, and God met it. So when people are saying, Lord, he is God, you can only imagine Elijah in that moment like, yes, God, that was, that was, ooh, that's what I'm talking about. You did it, God. You showed them. They're saying your name. They're choosing you. He's excited. And so Elijah said to them, seize the prophet. Now he's getting on. He's like, oh, so y'all with me now, right? Get all them prophets of Baal. Because just a little bit earlier, the, the queen got all the worshipers of God and the Lord, and she had them killed. So on that same standard, get all these 450 dudes that have been cutting themselves, grab them up. So the people grabbed them and let not one of them escape, and they seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. So because they had led the culture, the, the nation, into worshiping another god, that was an act unto death. The people agreed, like, yo, we've been serving the wrong God, and y'all here cutting themselves and stuff. I cut myself last week to get a prayer through, and I ain't even worth it. Oh, this dude got to die. So they took those 450 men, executed them. If you go through Kings also, this is afterwards. He prays, and then that drought ends. He runs down the, the, the mountain, and Elijah must have had some jets on him, because I think it was like 12 miles to where he needed to go. So this is all looking like... God, I did what you said. God, that's exactly what you wanted. I did what you called me to do. I handled your assignment. The people turned and said, the Lord is God. That's what's up. The nation's back in your hands again, God. He had to be celebrating. He had the worshipers of Baal killed. The water's coming. The rain's coming. All these signs point to God is real. Yes. So for him, the output looked like this is the assignment that you called me for. But then you hop over to 1 Kings 19. And Ahab, the king, he told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So the king who was washing it, 
He goes back home and tells his wife, like, hey, I was on the mountain and um, it was Elijah against Baal and the fire came down and that guy's kind of real. And then they took all the prophets, the prophets that you've kind of been, you know, your peoples, you know, the ones you've been worshiping with, and the ones that come eat with us. Yeah, he kind of like executed them. He killed all 450 of them. So she doesn't like that. So she says, and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So she says, then Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she throws out a threat like he killed my prophets. Uh uh. You know what? Hey, message. Go find Elijah. Tell him he got 24 hours. He's going to be dead just like them. Oh, you gonna kill my prophets, my God. Oh, you dying. And if you don't, it's going to happen to me if I don't kill you. So she said 24 hours, you're going to die. That's similar to when people are like, I put that on my mama. <laughs> Man, I put that on a street. I put that on, on hood, on set. Like, you put it on something to make it seem like, oh, this is really going to happen to scare somebody or make it that much down payment on it. Put this on everything I love. Do people still say that? I think that's, that used to be back in that. Hey, man, I put that on my, and you know the people are really getting into it. Put that on my dead mama. Like, really? Why is she a dead mama? Really? But yeah, she's saying that this is going to happen. You killed my prophets, you're going to die too. So if you think about Elijah's mind, God, you just showed yourself true. Your fire came down. The people proclaimed that you're God. They say, you're Lord. And then from then on, I go to pray and the rain comes back. Further show, display that you're real. But now the next day, I got this woman saying that she's a queen. She has the power to kill. What ha- God, why didn't she change? Why does she say you're God, you're Lord? She's the one that has so much influence over the nation. What happened to her heart, God? Why is she sending a death threat to me when I just did what you called me to do? This is not looking like what I thought it was. I thought I did the challenge. I bring the rain back and everything's going to go back to us serving you. But I got the queen trying to get my head. And so then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So out of fear of what she said, he takes off. He stopped looking at God and he took off based upon what her threat was. Saul had that same thing. Like, hey, this had to be done. You know, the enemy's coming, fight's coming. So I, I, would, I would eventually say it's at this moment that he let what was possible or what his expectation take place and it gave him an excuse to act in his natural. And so we look at verse four, he himself, after he left his servant, he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die. He goes before God like, hey, can can I, I'm done here. Can you just take me out? I'm I'm, I'm done here. He said, it is enough, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm done. I did what you asked. Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father. I'm, God, I just seen the outpouring of you coming down in fire. Your rain came back, and now this woman's trying to kill me? That means the people haven't turned back. What did I do? Did, did, it didn't have the output of what you, you showed. Like, you said this happens, the people are going to be turned back to you. They're not turned back to you because this woman's trying to kill me. And his mind... It was so severe that he didn't think it played out the way he thought. He wanted to take his own life, and he's like, I'm done here. I mean, granted, he was being searched for three years. They were trying to kill him for three years. But now, because he didn't have the output of what he expected, he's done. He gave up. He wanted God to take him. And we have to be mindful that we'll do things in God, and because the outcome's not what we expected, I like, mean, that's that was we wasted time. What are we enough enough? God, I'm done. I did what you asked me to. And the people still didn't learn. The people didn't turn towards you. The nation did start following you. I got this woman this queen who's trying to kill me. She got soldiers that are obedient. So they don't believe either. What? Ha- it was a waste of time. I've had enough of this. I've been serving you. I did what you called me to do. And it didn't have the outcome I was looking for. 
So for Elijah, even though he had this commanding action that we're reading about thousands of years later, he still had an expectation attached to it that was outside of God's will. Was God pleased with what done? Yeah. The fire came down. The drought ended. God was in all of that. But because the response of the people didn't play out the way he expected, he thought it wasn't intentioned. And we have to investigate that. Is there something that God's calling for you to do and the outcome's not exactly what you wanted, but you still had to carry it out? There's times where we're going to have to talk to somebody and God's going to give you instructions like, hey, I got in a dream. Oh, God gave me the dream. He showed me exactly the kitchen table we're going to be sitting at. He told me that the person's going to send me a text message. They're going to come meet. I see it. It's beautiful. And you're going to sit down with that person that you saw in the dream. And you're going to tell them everything that God said, expecting their life to switch over. And at the end of you saying everything, they're like, oh, that's what's up. That's cool. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to go get a Slim Jim and leave. You're like, God, you gave me the dream. I saw it all. Like, why aren't they over here pouring out tears and crying out on the altar? I saw it. I ain't, I ain't do anything. And God's like, you did what I told you to do? Yeah. That's what I wanted done. But, but God, that's what, that wasn't what I was expecting. It's not wasted. That's what I called for you to do. So regardless of what it played out the way that you wanted to play it out, that's what I wanted to happen. If you continue to read on 1 Kings... God then goes on to speak to Elijah directly and he tells him the next instruction. If you're looking on whether your assignment was wasted or incorrect, God rarely, I'm not going to say he does all, rarely does he give you a new assignment if you didn't handle the other one. I have people like, oh, hey, could you pray with me for God to guide my steps? Yeah, I, I will. But did you do the thing he told you to do last week, last, last month? Eh, I kind of. Yeah, my schedule, it wasn't, ugh. had some stuff to do, you know, life hit me, but just, hey, could you pray with me now, and then we'll see what God's saying, and then we pray, and God says the same thing. Yeah. Rarely does God say, hey, you didn't do that one assignment, here's a new one. No, you sometimes have to go back to that one and go on. So Elisha, for God to say, hey, here's your next assignment, your next assignment is to anoint the next king. And also your next assignment is to anoint the next pre your predecessor. And so he was given confirmation that this was done right yeah. for God giving him follow-up instructions. Yeah. So if you don't have the output you're looking for because you follow what God said and what looked like was going to be the conclusion and it wasn't, if God comes back and say, all right, now next. Like, wait, God, did I do that right? Yeah, you did. Nice. There's times where I'm like, I've done stuff in God. I'm like, all right, God, I, this is not looking the way it's supposed to be. You, you good. Keep going. Like, no, God, this is like in disarray. No, nah, you're good. This is, this is exactly what I wanted. Like, how does that play in? It's a factor. Just keep going. Uh, like, and so sometimes you feel like it's unproductive. Or you feel like it could have been wasteful. And God's like, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. There's so many tangibles that took place from the time you showed up to how many hours you put in, for how much money you put in. You might not see the boom numbers or people turn their life around, but there's little things in between that I left on the background, on the back burner that if you hadn't done it, they wouldn't have simmered by the time they come to a certain place, then it's going to be done. If you look at it from your standpoint of effective and productivity, you could be wrong. And so for Elisha, he had that. Elijah, he had that. And so for us, we can't view an assignment that God gives us as being effective or done correctly based upon what we see. Because if we do, we're going to be like, and eh, why would I do I shouldn't even done that. You know what? Next time, I ain't even going to do it. I've had people say that. I did what God told me to do. I spoke to that person. They cussed me out. I'm not ever doing it again. So then you thought it was wasteful and that manipulated in you not trying to go back into it again. View it from God's eyes. We're accountable for what the outcome is, regardless of whether we do it in an expectation or we do it unto what God's expectation is. So I want us to uh, rest on what we see sometimes as minimal or minuscule. God can call that thing valuable and vital. Those little details or the little things that we thought didn't factor or what was the outcome? We're like, what was that? that was a fizzle. God, what was that? We had a prayer meeting and two people showed up. Like, what was that? And God's like, did you listen to what happened in that? Did you hear the prayers that were prayed? Yeah, but 
Aren't we supposed to have like 20 people by now? Yeah. Did you hear what happened with the two? Yeah, God. And sometimes we carry that disappointment from that assignment into the next one and into the next one. And then after a while, you're walking God as one of expectation of disappointment based upon the output you're looking for. It can harden your heart to the next assignment. So we're accountable. We still have to do. We still have to do. Even if the outcome didn't look like we're projected, we're still accountable for carrying out the instructions. That's what God's calling for us. So as we're moving in, start to view it from God's lenses. Start to view it from like, God, you've been consistent. Even when I do something, it doesn't have that thing I was expecting. I know this is you. I, and you can. And we talked about this in the priority series. God was what I did. Was that pleasing to you? He's like, yes, it was. God, it doesn't look like what I thought. I know. But you did exactly what I wanted you to do. All right, God, that's 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 satisfying to me. What's the next one? And you move on. We're accountable for carry out and follow through, even if it doesn't match up to what we think. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So this week, as we're moving into our uh, uh, action portion, we talk about agreement requires action. It's not just, oh, I know. It's like you do. Either it's a passive, you like you're not supposed to do something, or you have to do. We must make sure our actions line up with God's agenda. Make sure what you're doing is what God's assigned. If it makes sense to you, it's nice. But if it's offshoot of God, you're going to be messed up. Assignments conducted without his direction can be dangerous. So if you pull a Saul, King Saul, like, hey, this needs to be done and um, it's the right thing. It's a wasted effort because you might have gone through all of it, invested time, money. But if that's not what he called for you, it was wasted. And also you're accountable for stepping into something you weren't supposed to. You can be in trouble by that. Likewise, it's crucial that we fulfill what he has assigned, even if the outcome isn't what we expected. Even if it's not like, well, this is how it's supposed to play. Oh, I do this is going to be fanfare and it's going to be an explosion of social media. People going to see the video lives. We're going to get comments. People saying that changed my life. And if you don't get all that. If you still do it to excellence and you get one person or you get one small thing that you consider small as output and God says, that's what I want to happen. You have to be pleased with that. He's the validator and we're accountable unto that. So, Lord, today I pray that um, we take in everything that you've said to us as crucial, as critical. We cannot filter what you're saying through our own agenda, our own will. Lord God, X out the factor of us that we see, Lord God. Remove our own desire or expectation. Let us see it from what you see. Let us say what you say. Let us do what you do, Lord God. Let us honor you first above all. We understand that there's natural and spiritual implications from our actions, Lord, but ultimately we want to make it pleasing unto you. So, Lord God, let us not be quick to jump into something that makes sense for us. It's practical. It's what needs to be done. If it's not us assigned to do it or if it's not supposed to be done right now, Lord God, let us be patient for your timing and your word to release us to move into it. And then also, Lord God, if we've been given an instruction and as we're doing it, we're not seeing the output that we're expecting. Let us still be excellent in the follow through. And even if it was an undershoot, even if the conclusion is something that we weren't anticipating, Lord God, let us not sour and in moving into you again for the next thing you called us into. Let us have the same fervor, the same fire, the same appetite to see that your kingdoms come. So, Lord, I pray over all of us here and those are those are in a virtual world, Lord God. Let us hear you with clarity and honor you with our actions, our thoughts our behaviors, our stances, Lord God, let us do it to where it's pleasing unto you. We are accountable for the outcome. If we're doing something outside of your will, and even though it needs to be done, Lord God, we're accountable for that because it wasn't for us to do. And if we do not step into because we fear that the outcome's not what we want, Lord God, we're accountable in that area too. So Lord God, as we're living in the season unto you and receiving the responsibility attached to who we are, Lord, we bless you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, young people, old people alike, and in between, we got work to do. Yeah. So I'm be looking for people in my house yeah. to be excited about assignments that they have to do yes. chore-wise. And so I'm going to need people to do it on their own or yeah. 
I'm not trying to take somebody else's. Uh, so prayerfully, you're, you're, you're progressing in this accountability, understanding that God has greater for us as we step into it. Because sometimes we, we hinder his move based upon we need, and God's like, in your movement is a release for your need. You're accountable for that too, so step into it, move into it, walk into it, and watch what I do. Amen? Um, so if you would like to bless the ministry, if you would like to donate, give, or this is, as I said, this is a form of worship. If you're seeing this unto God, if he's giving you an assignment on your giving, and because the last time you gave your tithe and, oh, I didn't get that back, God, that's still something that you have to do and honor him. We're not doing things with an expectation. I, granted, there's times in the past where I'm like, oh, God, you told me to give this $100. It's the last hundred. I give it like, boom, he'll kick it back with a thousand. Like, woo. And then I went back and did it again. God, you want me to give how much? Oh, sure. Bang. I give 500. Hey, what a, what a, what a 5,000? Hey, wait, wait. That's not what you did before. He's like, this is not what the functioning is. I want you to grow and worship in me. I want this to be done in love. Yeah, God, I got that, but that's why I hunt hurt. Like, there's times where I'm looking at it that, like that, but as I panned out and saw that it, it was a relationship builder, it got me to a place where I seen him above the value of the dollar or the value of what he was asking for. So if that's some area of difficulty of like, ah, this is difficult for me to step into, put it in prayer. But trust, this is the area where God wants to involve his, um, his hand in your life also. So put... Um, if you would like to give those are the means and then also if you're seeking Christ man There's been so many aspects. I mean go back if you haven't watched Wednesdays the Wednesday our conversations Y'all hearing my testimony. That's nice Hear the testimonies of so many others on Wednesdays when we're talking We hear so many testimonies of God said this he showed me this he stepped into my life We have a catch of what God's doing in the lives of his believers. So if you don't understand who he is or trust, go back. There's evidence in our conversations. He's real. He's valid. He's consistent. He's powerful. He's patient. He's loving. He's just. He's supreme. He's, he's, he's victorious. He's all of that. So if you need any other evidence that he's real, go back. Watch a video or two. You'll hear his hand in the midst of everything. And in it, it gives you an introduction of this is possible for you. If you don't know God to that degree, Jesus is offering himself. He's like, hey, I want to talk to you. I've been waiting. Just come through. So it starts with you saying, like, God, I recognize you as my Lord and Savior. I've heard about what you've done. I read it in the Bible. And now I receive you. I receive that you died on my behalf. You took my sins and you rose from the grave. And you've given your Holy Spirit for me to live out according to what you say. So as you're praying, as you let these words leave your mouth, understand that there's a change that's going to take place. And as you're stepping into a life that God has assigned for you, connect with us. We will help you on your walk. We'll give you testimonies to add to where you are, and we'll allow God to build from where you are. Amen? Amen. And then for our in-house folks, I am going to open up the altar as always. I'm allow, uh, if you want to get before God, hey, we was praying earlier. That's why my voice is kind of crackling now. It's in the atmosphere, just being before him. So if you just want a couple moments to come lay out on the altar, you can. If you want to pray.